Welcome in, everyone. John Davis here, the host of For the Good of the Game podcast. I want to say a special thanks to William Warfield, the king of stream and prep spin, and Mingy Beef Jerky for sponsoring the uh, the spot tonight. Really appreciate being on. And we have three very special guests tonight. And we're going to spend about the next 45 minutes to an hour talking some offensive football. So for a little bit of perspective, I'm going to take just about two minutes here and kind of introduce our three guests. Chris Miller was a three-sport athlete at Sheldon High School in Eugene, Oregon, who chose to stay home in-state and play college football at the University of Oregon. His career with the Ducks propelled him to the 13th overall pick in the 1987 NFL Draft, beginning a 12-year NFL career playing for the Atlanta Falcons, the L.A. slash St. Louis Rams, and the Denver Broncos. Chris was as coached extensively at the high school level, but has also served as the quarterback's coach for the Arizona Cardinals, and most recently was the offensive coordinator for the XFL's Houston Roughnecks. Coach Miller is, was a 2005 inductee into the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame. So Chris wanted to say thanks for being here and welcome to the show. Thanks, J.D. Thanks for having me. Our next get, our, Oh, you're welcome. Our next guest, Wes Chandler, was a standout athlete at New Smyrna Beach High School who accepted a scholarship to play football for the Florida Gators. His career at Florida was highlighted by numerous achievements, resulting in being chosen by the New Orleans Saints as the number three overall pick in the 1978 NFL Draft. West played 11 seasons in the NFL with the Saints, San Diego Chargers, and San Francisco 49ers. Since retiring, he's coached at the college, NFL Europe, and NFL levels, and Coach Chandler's post-career awards include inductions into the University of Florida Athletic Hall of Fame, the San Diego Chargers Hall of Fame, and most recently, the College Football Hall of Fame. So, Coach Chandler, well, Wes, welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Yes, sir. Now, last but not least, heralded by many as one of the best all-time offensive line coaches, Coach James Mouse McNally has over 40 years of coaching experience, 28 of which were in the NFL. Coach McNally's career began at the University of Buffalo as both a player and a coach. He followed UB with stints at Marshall, Boston College, and Wake Forest. His 28-year NFL coaching career includes stops with the Cincinnati Bengals, highlighted by two Super Bowl appearances, the Carolina Panthers, New York Giants, and Buffalo Bills. Since retiring, Coach McNally has served as a consultant to both the Jets and currently the Cincinnati Bengals. Coach McNally is a member of both the University of Buffalo Athletic Hall of Fame, as well as the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. So it is with distinct pleasure and uh, a great joy for me because I get to see these three gentlemen again uh, after long breaks in time. So, guys, I, I really, really appreciate you all taking time to share your, your wisdom and experiences tonight. Great. Good to be here. Are you mate? Were you Major or Colonel Davis? I forgot. <laughs> Colonel Davis. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, Look at oh, my hat. You you USA Today, <laughs> there you go. Um, listen, guys, I, I one of the things that, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have been watching and uh, and I've certainly been paying attention to is how much struggle there is right now with coaches, particularly younger coaches and at the high school and, and or college levels because of the COVID-19 crisis. So tonight's focus is is a little bit more. Uh, about offense, but keeping that in mind as, uh, you know, as it is in terms of the way it limits things. So what I'd like to do is give each of you a couple of minutes on, on a first question to kind of break the ice. And with regard to the positions that you played and coached, how has the offensive game evolved over the last 20 years or so uh, it, from the perspective of what you have you know, what you had learned as a player and what you've coached in the past. So uh, Coach McNally, as, as, the, uh, as the senior man present, I'll let you go first. Well, I think in the, uh, in the offensive line, whether it's college, high school, or pro, old school back 20, 30, well, maybe before that, it was fire out, knock them off the ball, you know, stick your head in, uh, all that good stuff, you know, how tough can you be? And I think what we found over the years that there's a lot better ways to block your guy uh, and still, you know, move them and, uh, you know, win the battle, et cetera. Uh, and I think recently because of the fact of keeping the head out of contact, particularly out of the block, 
uh, that there are new and better ways, and it's not rocket science, to use your technique so that you are avoiding the concussions and the injuries that you know we're all talking about nowadays. So I think in the offensive line, it's gone more to almost like sumo wrestling that uh, you see those big sumo guys, they kind of, they, you know, they waddle around and they stand up a little higher than the old days, but believe it or not, they are as strong or stronger in the positions they use than the old school fire out and knock them on their butt. So I guess that's my two cents on maybe updating old line play. Wes, how about, you know, from you and Chris's standpoint, it's a lot has to do with the evolution of the passing game and the proliferation of the passing game. So from a wide receiver standpoint, what do you see uh, way different than, say, when you played back with Eric Coriel? Well, it's a little bit different. I, I had the fortunate pleasure of playing in two offenses, actually, Eric Coriel in the end of my career in San Francisco uh, under Bill Walsh. And those offenses are still happening today where we took advantage of the talent we had uh, utilizing run, running back in the passing game, making sure that you had more than one quality receiver on both sides. Now, the only difference between Eric Coriel uh, and the Bill Walsh system uh, was the simple fact that uh, when, when you look at San Francisco, you had two mobile quarterbacks. That's key in today's game. Uh, Steve Young and Mahuka by time get out, out on the but because we, they, you know, you had a running game, the play action was still available uh, to that offense. In San Diego, we did not have the mobile quarterback in Dan Fouts, but we had a great running game behind James Brooks and Chuck Muncie. But we also took advantage of Lionel James uh, and Gary Anderson by putting them out sometimes to take advantage of the coverage uh, that linebackers and strong sa uh, safeties that might not want to box and cover. So to me, it's basically the same uh, as I see where offenses are taking advantage of drafting kids that are more mobile and can buy time and help the offensive line uh, by buying time in the passing game and also having a strong running game. Mm -hmm. How about you, c -Mill, with regard to uh, quarterback play? We've seen kind of a myriad of stuff since you played in terms of, you know, the classic drop back passer in the pocket versus the uh, two, you know, the, the dual threat quarterback like we have now. How do you see it has evolved from a quarterback's perspective? Well, I think first off, just acknowledging what, what Wes referred to, it's really cool. I mean, he, he named two of the legends of offensive creativity in football with uh, Don Eric Coriel and Bill Walsh. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, having just coached the XFL Houston Roughnecks with June Jones, we were running the run and shoot offense, which was really – enjoyable for me. I, I ran it as a player from 1990 to 1993. Uh, so it was kind of a, a fun experience for me to reconnect with June Jones. Ironically, June Jones spent a lot of time with Bill Walsh uh, over in Hawaii and implemented a lot of the West Coast concepts into the run and shoot. So it's kind of neat from a quarterback standpoint, an offensive coordinator, offensive mind to see how the different schemes kind of interact over the years. I'd say from a quarterback standpoint, Probably the biggest change is, you know, back what when when uh, Jim was referring to offensive line play and, and Wes's era, the game uh, as a quarterback was played from under center. Uh, early in my career in the NFL, even in the run and shoot with June Jones in the early to mid 90s, you know, we played from under center. So, you know, I'm standing right here and Reggie White's a yard and a half for me on the other side of the ball. And, uh, you know, nowadays, nowadays the game has really evolved especially in high school and college and even the professional level that is played out of the shotgun, uh, especially in college where guys like um, Justin Herbert, Marcus Mariota, Joe Burrow are having to learn how to replay the game from under center when they leave an all shotgun college offense and go into the NFL. So I'd say that's probably the biggest thing from a quarterback standpoint is, is having our, our hands under a center's butt back in the day as compared to now being in the shotgun and, and uh, I think like uh, you touched on, you know, dual threat offenses nowadays are huge. Guys who can run like Wes was talking about with Steve Young and Joe Montana make those offenses that much more harder to defend. Yeah, I think one of the things, and I and, and C-Mail, I know I've mentioned this to you before. When when I was playing football, I, I didn't – I wasn't taught how to read a defense pre-snap read until I got to college. And nowadays they're teaching eight, eighth grade quarterbacks to do that. So I think one level of sophistication 
that has occurred in the game, uh, pushing those kinds of things down to a lower level, is that you get a lot more pre-snap jousting, if you will, between defensive coordinators and, and the players on the field, uh, you know, trying to disguise coverages and things like that. So it really does take um, a step up in terms of football IQ for even young men at the middle school and high school level to learn the game, especially if they play in a dynamic offense. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order this time, uh, Chris, if you would. What What's uh, in anticipation, We like leading off the show, I talked about, you know, we're obviously shut in, sheltering at home with this COVID-19 going on. And high schools all around the country, if they have a season, are certainly looking at no spring ball, uh, shorter preseason, and possibly having seasons pushed back and shortened. So from an offensive standpoint, and again, we'll go in reverse order this time, what key ingredients would you recommend that coaches focus on as they install team offense, you know, given the parameters and the constraints that we have to work within right now? Well, it's a great question. I just uh, got hired uh, uh, at a high school up here in Portland, Oregon as the head coach. So it's really, uh, it really is, you know, translates to kind of where I'm at right now. I think the main thing is I look at kind of a four month program. The, the first game is scheduled for September 4th. So we're almost to early May. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, the, the first month of, of, of May, we're really going to just kind of try to excite the team. I think it's probably easier for coaches that are in place in their high schools right now that already have a system or a scheme that's implemented or installed and the kids already know it. And it was taught at the JV level and freshman level. So those, those guys have a big advantage. Me being a new high school head coach, kind of how I'm looking at it is I'm going to uh, – you know, send out an email, introduce myself and things and kind of make May more of a focus on the physical part of it. Hey, make sure we're getting, you know, doing a couple hundred push-ups a day or doing sit-ups and doing, you know, activity type things. And then in June, do more football-oriented things, position, position-specific things. And what I would anticipate and imagine is that we'll probably get our hands on these kids maybe in July, after the 4th of July or somewhere in there, that we'll have a couple months of hands-on of you know, running routes and installing and, and doing these things together as a group. So really, I think a lot of it now is going to be over Zoom meetings, probably uh, emailing some offensive install, basic verbiage, terminology, alignment, assignment, snap count, some of those things. And so just kind of educating them a little bit on some of the concepts and things that will run, not giving them too much, but just a little introductory uh, before I kind of understand, you know, what skill sets and where their strengths are in terms of you know, quarterbacks and receivers and those guys. So, you know, from a pragmatic standpoint, I think less is, less is going to be more in this instance. And I look at it as a, a four-month plan to kind of uh, approach that. And really, I think repetition is key. So if I do a little bit of install in, in May, I want to hit that same install in June. Then in July, when we work together as a group, we can hit that install for a third time. And then when we get into August for camp, we hit it again for a fourth time. So you get that good repetition uh, you know, for, for memory and those type of things. So they have some retention. Yeah, those are great points. Wes, what do you think in terms of uh, from an offensive standpoint as these coaches, you know, compared to what Chris has faced with, with being a new coach in a new program for guys that, you know, have been around a while and at least have the inside track on knowing their kids, what would be the focus you'd recommend to these guys in, with limited time to kind of get things rolling? I think it's, uh, to Chris's point, uh, it, the game of football is two ways. It's mental and physical. And, and during this time, because they're home, uh, the mental aspect is, is key also. Uh, today, most kids or most professional athletes have workout, uh, workout material at home, either in the yard or on the back porch if they have a room dedicated to weight training. So that aspect of self-care taking care of physically is there. Establish a routine, whether it's weekly, uh, and as the months go by, you get up and you get into that routine. Uh, you do upper or lower uh, certain days, and, and that's your physical and that's your self-care. Uh, the next part is the um, is the film study, and that's very important because now this aspect of the game where you have a student in the game, uh, refreshing your mind to the play and the understanding of the concepts that's been installed and understanding uh, what it means on each and every play. Becoming a better student of the game is a great opportunity here at home and they have an opportunity to put more time into that playbook 
where a lot of players are only worried about themselves and not worried about uh, what it entails for that play to be successful and why they're having to go through the safety or pull the linebacker, hold the linebacker. So that's important to have an opportunity to best understand the overall of that one particular play so that the team has success each and every individual play. The other part of it is the fact that you need some social media outlet. You need some face time. Uh, you need to spend some time with your friends and your family through social media, sort of like what we're today. It helps make the day go by, but also it keeps your sanity aspect of wanting to get out of the house. And in certain states, in certain areas, you just can't get up and do it. Out here in California, you just can't do it. So what are these players doing? They're taking advantage of the, the fact that we live in a, a digital world today. Just pull up the phone, pull up the iPad, pull up the laptop, and talk to your friends and your family. You can even do that talking with your quarterback and if your receiver to get a better understanding. You can send each other questions with regards to plays, etc. I think that helps. And the last and most important thing, because this may be a fast out of the gate season on every level, because we don't know uh, what this pandemic is going to create schedule wise. I suggest that a self-care perspective that all these athletes take the time to stretch. And that's going to be very important because you don't want any pulls to any cares that may be in anyone's offense uh, when this thing up and started. You can't afford to miss weeks here or there because it may be a shortened season. It may be a strike type of season uh, given the aspect of this pandemic if you're going to get it in. That's a great point. And I'll tell you, I have, I have really bent to uh, so much of the, the current vernacular because when I played, um, it, I played in the era where, you know, I get home from practice and, and put my leather helmet on the wall and, and park my dinosaur. And I, work, I played for coaches that use phrases like water is highly overrated and don't forget your salt pills and uh, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So I, I, I think that uh, the, the, one of the biggest things that I've seen is is what you hit on, Wes, is flexibility is absolutely key to injury prevention. And uh, it doesn't matter what position you play. So I think it's That's very great. valuable. Coach, Coach McNally, what about you from an offensive line perspective as far as coaches? Uh, what, you, what are the key ingredients you think in a limited preparation season that they need to focus on to try and be successful coming out of the gate? Well, I would think – just thinking, let's say we didn't start practice. I'm just off the top of my head. Maybe we don't start practice till uh, late August, maybe September. Who knows? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. I mean, that's we all would like to keep it simple. But maybe if you had uh, 15 running plays, you cut it down to seven. Maybe you only run certain plays to the right and certain plays to the left. And I know because of the hash marks, Unlike pro football, you know, there's generally a wide side of the field, the short side of the field. But, you know, I, when I was with a few teams, uh, like we would run, say, the the power play where, uh, you know, the left guard would pull. We only ran that to the right. Maybe we would run a different kind of a pulling guard play only to the left and maybe only to the split end. So, um, and I don't think it matters because when you line up, they don't know if you're going to run to the tight end or to the split end. But I would think that making it simple. I would think, and then Chris and Wes know more than I do, but the timing with the passing game is going to be much more difficult with less time to practice, particularly if they can't practice with each other and they can't be around each other. I mean, you know, you want eight or nine receivers together with two or three quarterbacks throwing the football. Well, it, will that even be allowed? But so I'm not so sure, and I like a wide open game, I'm not so sure the running game wouldn't take over. That the coaches would think, oh, we're gonna run fewer plays and we're gonna run the ball because perhaps the timing of the routes and the receivers and the hot reads isn't gonna be as difficult as when the quarterback hands the ball off. So whatever. I, I tell you what, I think that is a, a, a that's a great point. Going back to the days of Bronco Nagurski, you know, three steps in a cloud of dust kind of thing. You know, you get the you get the guy. If you're fortunate enough to have a uh, a running back that's you know that's powerful or or uh, prances really well, that running game may be maybe king. Um, 
let me let me switch gears just a little bit in, in the same focus um if you were sitting down to mentor an individual athlete right now um what from from what you've learned in in not only playing but coaching at the highest level and and really uh working with guys that have succeeded on on numerous levels getting up to the nfl going back down to the college or even high school level what general athletic priorities and you guys touched on a couple of these as you were talking a minute ago but what general athletic priorities would you recommend that athletes set for themselves in order to maximize the time available that they have this year and and wes i'll i'll defer to you first you, you talked a little bit about flexibility any other priorities you think are important to them right now I think I think flexibility is to me is number one for the simple fact that even some of the kids that you see that are that are great athletes, they're a little bit stiff in the hips uh, and don't have as great body control as you would like to have in order for them to maximize their potential on the field. And so therefore, flexibility is very important. How, how you accomplish that uh, right now is in the house and on the floor and taking the time to increase your muscle, muscle flexibility. I, I can't under, underscore that. I think it's so very important. Unfortunately, they can't get reps in as they, they would like to, uh, as, as Jim uh, touched on, where Chris and I would love to go out and, and get some reps in and throw the route so we have time and confidence in one another because that's so very important. But at the same token, I think that really, really will, will evolve. But this to me, I, I can't say anything other than that's number one, flexibility. How about you, Coach McNally, from an offensive line standpoint? When those athletes oh, are setting their priorities. Absolutely. I agree with uh, what Coach Chandler said, that uh, uh, with offensive line on any level, if a kid is stiff, you know, he bends at the waist, he's a little awkward, uh, that's not good. So, uh, you know, bending, uh, flexibility, uh, stretching. Uh, the other thing with the O-line is – Moving your feet 100 miles an hour, and uh, you know you don't move them way up, way off the ground like this, but just little steps. Take little steps. Everything you do is little steps, little steps. Because if you take a big step, then you have to change direction. So I guess uh, you know you can you can jump rope, you can do all different kinds of things. But anything that you do with small steps, bending, flexibility, arching your back, uh, and and that, those types of things. Uh, I think are are the most important. Period. Chris, drawing back on your experiences prior to the XFL, just prior doing West Lynn for several years and going back into that now, what do you see as those priorities that you're going to be reinforcing or, or emphasizing going into this season? Well, I'm training about five QBs right now and had a group of, of four out the other day and five the week before. And we practiced social distancing, kind of lined up guys in their spots and kept the quarterback back in his spot. And I snapped to him. So we made sure we weren't, you know, slapping high fives or doing any of that. We, we bumped little elbows from, from here and there going. But so I think, you know, a lot of these high school kids are losing the opportunities, especially kids who are going to be seniors. They're losing that opportunity for those uh, showcase camps, those seven-on-seven -seven competitions throughout the spring. Um, the spark training opportunities, the one-day college camps, you know, are probably all going to be canceled in June. I know I've heard from several college coaches that those are canceled. So what I've been kind of doing with some of these guys is building little hit tapes. Now, this is guys who are going to be seniors and want to continue on and aspire playing college football. So we're going out, and yesterday I videotaped a tight end and a wide receiver, and my quarterback was thrown to him. So we're trying to kind of put together a, a huddle package, where they're at today, running their routes and details and catching radius and all those things, or videoing a quarterback, how he throws it, his accuracy, mechanics. And so I'm helping those guys put together these little portfolio packages to send out to a bunch of my college contacts. So I think in terms of speaking from a quarterback standpoint is to make sure you stay active uh, with your footwork, you don't lose your fundamentals. You don't lose your technique. So it's nice to have somebody like me who has those extra set of eyes uh, to help them keep on point and, and coach every rep, so to speak. Um, keep that arm strength intact. You know, you don't want to be going out there and throwing a high volume of throws uh, every day. But maybe you're throwing, you know, 50 to 100 throws three days a week. So you're keeping your 
your sharpness and you're building up your 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 inventory of throws and your arm strength and and some of those things. So I think staying sharp at your craft, especially being a quarterback, is imperative. Um, and then what West t- touched on, I really liked for a quarterback. I can go on huddle and watch my 2019 games from last year. And if I was the starter, I'm watching myself play. But if I was a backup, uh, you know, then I'm going to go learn and watch from what the other guy did in front of me, the starter, and go watch some of the opponents that were playing in the upcoming 2020, 2020 season and just kind of uh, attack that mental aspect of it too, where you're studying your key, your schemes and your concepts and, and your plays. So really it's kind of a two or three pronged approach. Make sure you're staying active, keep your quarterback traits good, your footwork, your throwing mechanics, those things, and then working on the mental aspect of the game as well. You know, with regard to the mental aspect, I, we, we, I haven't really talked to a whole lot of people about this, although I'm, I'm a huge proponent of it, but what it, I'd be interested just from the standpoint of the, the the generations of football that you guys have played and not only timing wise the the eras that you played in coached in but um what do you guys think about athletes today using some form of simple meditation uh and and visualization skills for that mental training while they're especially while we're cooped up coach mcnally you you have much you you have much faith in that kind of thing well i think i would depends on the the player. I mean, most of the uh, offensive linemen are pretty sharp guys, but uh, I would say the attention span to do some meditation for somebody that's uh, 15, 16, 17 years old, ah, I'm not sure about that. You know what I mean? <laughs> They'd be playing with their phones or calling the girls or this, that, or the other. I mean, you'd have to, I think, I think <laughs> it, it's a good idea, but I think you'd have to it would have to be the kind of the kids that are going to go to Harvard or Yale that might want to, and, and I think it's a great idea, but I don't know if you could sit them down long enough for them to just really, you know, listen to that waterfall, you know, go over the, go over the Hudson River there, you know, and meditate a little bit. But I think it's a great idea, but I'm, I'm ADD, so I don't think I would be able to do that. Well, you know, and, and I, I think it's, It's very true. The maturity piece of it is huge. Uh, uh, But I believe that, you know, for the older kids, uh, certainly for college athletes, I think that there's been so much written and done on visualization, particularly with Olympic athletes um, and the value of being able to visualize, you know, the the next step of what you want to do, whether it's a running a route or or throwing a pass or or just operating within the offense um, could be valuable. Let me let me uh, skip over to something else that uh, I think is has been a hot topic uh, in the last year. I've probably read 10 articles um, and, and by such notable people as Dr. James Andrews, uh, multiple different coaches at all different levels. So I'd be interested for each of you all, and I know your backgrounds obviously and, and, and that kind of thing, but for our, for our listeners and people watching the, the show, based on your experience in the game of football, How do you feel about young athletes? And let's start, say, at the middle school age. I'm going to eliminate the youth sports piece right now. But for middle school and high school athletes, how how valuable do you think the multi-sport approach is in the in the with regard to the future of the game of football? And if they're going to specialize, when do you think it's appropriate? Uh, Chris, I'll ask you to go first. You know, I'd say the, the biggest thing I would encourage kids to do is, is do as much as you can when you're young. Uh, you know, I think probably all three of us, Jim and Wes and I, we probably all three played three sports back in high school. And I would like to have played four or five if I could have done track and golf, but we just didn't have the time because I was a baseball guy in the spring. So, you know, I would encourage kids to play as many as they can while they're young, because really our best, some of our best memories are when we're high school age kids. So, you know, I don't want to regret not having played high school basketball or high school baseball or golf or football or whatever. So, and I think, frankly, in the recruiting process, uh, college coaches look for dual sport, multi-sport athletes. Um, you know, I know Urban Meyer and several other coaches, you know, talk about it often that they want to know that their guy is their guy they're recruiting is out there playing, doing track, working on his speed, working on his explosiveness, working on his technique. Or he's a wrestler, you know, he's a wrestler football guy. So he's going to be a tough, tenacious guy who's not afraid of hard work and has that really tough physical mentality and ability to grind like wrestlers do. So I think for youth kids, man, do as much as you can. Um, You know, I don't think, I think parents should be um, 
supportive of that. I think it's harder on parents nowadays because there is so much emphasis on specialization and on private training, privatized training, club teams, club volleyball that goes nine, 10 months out of the year, or, you know, these travel seven on seven football teams now that start in the win winter when football season is done and go through the spring. So I think some of those things put uh, constraints or challenges on kids being multi-sport athletes, but I want, you know, if I have kids I'm coaching, I want to go play basketball, I'm go play baseball, go wrestle, do whatever, because it's the, the best memories that I had in terms of athletics and sports. So I would encourage them to do as much as they can, especially when they're young. And then probably when you get into high school, you might narrow it down to maybe your your, your two favorite sports and, and your sports that you think that you're best at. Wes, what do you think about the uh, the crossover that kids get, particularly from a receiver standpoint, like the hand-eye coordination blocking out with basketball, um, you know, the the, the hand-eye coordination with baseball? Uh, what, do you think it's it's important uh, for the receiver? I, I think so. well, well. Well, when you're young, it, it, to Chris's point and to Jim's point, it, it's about interaction. And your high school days and the opportunity to participate in all sports, I was a four-sport guy. I found time between track and baseball to run off the track field to go do baseball or do do it vice versa. And after football season was over, I was on the basketball court uh, and coming right out of football, right into basketball, I had strong hands. So it, it really, really helped me. I think that one of the, the biggest positions that has shown growth uh, in, in, in football has been the power forward position out of basketball for these tight ends. Tony Gonzalez and, and these guys, look at where they come from, what they originally were. They were great basketball players. And now they're out, they were outstanding tight ends, you know, in the National Football League. And a lot of people look now to discover the next uh, Antonio Gates out the block because they're looking on the basketball court. So to, to know that these athletes, they can block, and that's what you hear the term, uh, with these foot, with these tight ends now because they play basketball and they understand how to position themselves against linebackers and safeties because they had had that ability and that's something they were used to. For me, I believe that they should play any sport that they can, providing one thing, that it does not sacrifice the academics because without that, the next opportunity on the collegiate level never comes to be able to handle that if you're going to participate Absolutely. And that's a big challenge for a lot of kids, uh, particularly because, you know, they say that uh, I think the statistics right now are that 65 to 68 percent of kids in the United States are living in single parent homes of, from one reason or another, either because of divorce or death or whatever. And, and that's uh, that makes it tough from a parental management standpoint and leadership standpoint, parenting standpoint. And sometimes those positive influences aren't there. Uh, to guide kids through that, to stay focused and keep that academic side rolling. Um, so, Coach McNally, from a standpoint of uh, offensive line play and multi-sport preparation, um, do you have any guys that you coach that stick out in your mind that you knew were, you know, for instance, that were wrestlers in high school or college that translated over into great technique when they became offensive linemen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think what you're talking about, the the three or four sport guys, you're talking about the skilled athletes like Chris Miller or like Wes Chandler. You don't find too many offense and defensive linemen that are multi-sport. Now that doesn't mean they don't wrestle or play football, but generally nowadays, the kid that's a football player is a football player. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't like basketball. He's just not quite good enough to play basketball at two, two, 270 pounds, which all these high school kids are now. But, but, uh, Oh, yeah. You know, there's no question that like uh, Tim Crumry, although he was a defensive lineman, he could have been an offensive lineman, was a great college wrestler at Wisconsin. Scott Peters, another kid I coached, uh, who's now the line coach for the Cleveland Browns. He was a high school wrestler outstanding. So, yeah, there, there's a number. I mean, there's so many of them. I can't single a lot of them out. But generally, uh, like an O and a D lineman, their other sport is generally uh, wrestling. And I think that's a, ter a terrific sport. You know, uh, it's it's probably one of the hard, hardest sports to compete in because, you know, for the two or three minutes, I mean, you're giving it 110% every 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 minute. And I will say this about uh, 
the, what I'm noticing, of, you know, doing a lot of camps and this, that, and the other, what I think is missing from the old days or even the days when Chris and Wes were in high school is now the kids are so concerned about um, what, uh, you know, their highlight film and their YouTube and this, that, and the other, that they don't really enjoy playing for their high school team. they I mean, the, all they care about is, is their highlight film going here? Are they on YouTube? Uh, you know, they got to go to this camp, this camp, and this camp, and they're missing 90% of their high school career enjoying where they are right now. You know what I mean? And they're always looking to the future. I guess it's no different for the college kid looking to be when he's going to get drafted or this, that, or the other. I, I, I'm not sure they're enjoying their time. The kids that are enjoying their time are the ones that aren't going to be pro athletes, that aren't going to be college athletes. You know, you look at how many people in, in, in how many kids that play sports, how many of them are going to be college terrific athletes or professional athletes. Those are your real <laughs> athletes, those kids. Yeah, it's interesting. We were, I was on a USA football webinar last night and there was a head coach from Cincinnati a high school head coach from Cincinnati talking and the conversation was going in the vein of, you know, you train the focus right now is you're training human beings first and you're training athletes second and really you're training football players third. So it's, he said, I've got 114 people on my varsity football team and about 32 of them are football players. So he says, I've got bigger concerns in terms of the game and athletics in making sure that these folks, that these athletes are eating right, getting enough sleep, studying properly and doing all that. He said the game of football almost becomes secondary for those kids that Jim just talked about that aren't going to be college football players, that they have fun, that they love the game, they feel like they're contributing, they're part of a team and they're enjoying themselves. And I think that a lot of what you guys talk about, when I was in the army, we worried about weapons of mass destruction back in the Cold War. Right now, they call this right here a weapon of mass distraction. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it sure is. To your, they, uh, to, and, and, and to your point, one of the things that that uh, that I, I missed out on, on on mentioning is the fact that nutrition also during this time can play a major role um, with these kids because. Like Jim said, they're, they're not interested in right now. They're doing this and doing this or doing this. And the problem comes <laughs> if they're not drinking and putting a lot of sugar in their tank. What's going to happen if they're not eating properly? So nutrition becomes a major, major focus for these kids during this time at any level. I agree, Coach. I agree. And I, I, I see part of the problem, and each of you touched on it in a little bit different way without really saying it, but part of the problem, and, and look, I am a, I, I understand that there is a place for competitive athletics. There's a place for kids to be on travel teams and to groom themselves and so on at some point in their athletic career. But for me, there is a $17 billion competitive youth sports business out there that has been built on the backs of young people starting at about the fourth grade. And it's that whole industry of selling kids on going to camps. And, you know, so I saw a thing on Facebook two days ago where a young man had a recruiting page and he had a picture of himself action photo and it talked about his attributes and how good he was. And I'm looking at it and he was in the class of 2029. It, he was 10 oh. years old. And, and I just, I, I was, I was flabbergasted. I just, I was taken back. So I want to, I want to kind of transition into something that plays off of that. And this will kind of be our, our, our swan song here, but I wanted this could become quite a, a, a topic today. <laughs> The NCAA released their initial findings about the what's called the NIL name, uh, image and likeness uh, legislation, yeah. if you will. It's not legislation, actually, because NCAA is not a legislating body, but um, they released their initial piece on it. This whole thing going toward athletes at the collegiate level being able to accept endorsement money for their name, image and likeness. And there are certain restrictions and so on now. I just want to state up front, 
I am all for, I was not a scholarship athlete in college. I am all for athletes getting paid, um, not by the universities, but in, if, if they have the ability to go out and garner being, you know, making money on their own and not being penalized for it, I think that's great. The thing I see is, is twofold that I'm worried about. One, I think that it is going to bring out a whole lot of uh, wolves in sheep's clothing who will start grabbing the ears of parents and talking to parents about, hey, I think I can steer your kid this direction and so on because they want to make money off of these kids. And the other thing is, I, I don't understand how, and I don't have a good solution to suggest, how they're going to balance the getting paid part with true amateurism, which has been, you know, pro, they, NCAA has been the primary proponent of that. And really the only one left when you look at the fact that now professional athletes can compete in the Olympics. So I, I'm Coach McNally, I'm going to start with you. What do you what do you think about all this? Obviously, we don't have answers right now, but what's your take on how this is well, going I mean, bad for the so game what, of football? What, who, who's, what conferences are going to are going to pay their kids? I, what I'm saying is, it going to be the is it going to be Nike? Is it going to be Reebok? Uh, is it going to yeah. be the NCAA? Who's going to pay them one? And number two, what about the smaller leagues? What about the Mid American Conference? What about uh, some of those Division three schools? I mean. Are you just going to pay the top teams, the top ten teams? Uh, so I have no idea how they, how they're going to do that. I mean, I get the feeling that it's going to be, uh, you know, somebody like Nike or, or, or some major company is going to pick out certain athletes and they're going to pay them more than someone else. But, but uh, I, I think they're certainly deserving. How they do it, I, I have no idea. How about you, Wes? These kids have been walking billboards for years, and it's it's old school. This is not this is new. It's just that the universities uh, have have taken advantage, and agents have taken advantage in regards to agents pulling parents' ears and grabbing their ears. Ears that starts right now with AAU. There's 750,000 AAU uh, participants, and guess what? They're there for the simple fact that, that this is the elite of the elite. Most of these guys are being contacted by people who want to represent them later because they see the value or the upside of that particular athlete. Okay, that's a fact. On the on the collegiate level, when I when I was at the University of Florida, yeah, you got laundry money and then that was cut out. But today they get grants, be it 800, a quarter, or what have you, that's going to increase. And the reason being is because guess what? You're being paid as a collegiate athlete, whether it's basketball or football, to wear something. And it has, whether it's Under Armour, whether it's Nike, you 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 don't have a choice. You walk into that program, you have to wear those sneakers. Look at Duke as an example. So why does the university get paid for the rights for a basketball team or a coach should get paid? And the athlete is the one who's doing walk and billboard. When Zion Williamson put on those Nikes, he wasn't hit by Nike, but he was advertising on behalf of Nike as well as Duke University. So it's, it, it was an injust, but because you're already giving some of these kids the opportunity to fill out these grants, go ahead and increase the grant. I don't think that there's a conference today that does not have a representation from you or from a jury perspective. So I think that because you're you're asking these 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 conferences and these individuals because they don't get a vote as to what shoe or what jersey that they wear, the companies uh, are going to pay it because guess what? At the end of the day, if I'm just Joe Blow, an offensive lineman, and it happens to be Adidas, you are getting marketing and advertising space free from me. Because so happen to get out there, and you may not see it, but when you see my jersey on television, get that logo, and that means something to you from a business perspective. So my just do, even on the division two or three level, comes back. Hey, I deserve something, and that's part of the league where the league itself, be it Ivory League itself, should get that because it's the same as TV contracts, isn't it? All the leagues now have TV contracts and all the all these schools are getting 
a percentage of the television packages for, for this. And that schools are moving uh, and had the opportunity to move from one conference to the other because the conference dollars in terms of television revenue was huge. The digital space also is if, if the very same way. Putting that product on, and seeing that logo means something, whatever that logo is. And the kids are exploited behind it because they are actually the talent. So they deserve the opportunity to get their likeness and their name paid for, but on an equal, equal basis, whatever that, that share is. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the hard part to regulate. Um, it, it's Seamill, you've got a very unique position being an Oregon guy, the home of Phil Knight. You know, the Ducks have had the most creative uh, iterations of uh, Nike uniforms for years and years. Um, I mean, how yeah. do you feel about it from the standpoint of just, you know, having experienced it as a college athlete uh, about these kids getting getting compensated? Well, first off, Wes, I think, still getting paid from Florida. Uh, so. <laughs> it used to be in the form of $100 handshakes, but now it's uh, they mail him a, a, a royal something. But no, it's, we all had teammates, I think, probably got some of those handshakes back in the day or we hear those stories. But That's the thing. Uh, and all seriousness, you know, Phil Knight's a good friend of mine, Phil and Penny, who uh, are own Nike and, and are Oregon alums and are, gosh, philanthropic and generous beyond belief uh, in so many different ways. I think they both kicked in $50 million to this coronavirus research uh, to, to find a, a remedy for it. So they're, they're tremendous folks. But uh, one thing Oregon does, I think, is pretty cool, and it's unique because they are the test pilots for all of Nike's uniforms and such. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a added bonus for them. But what they do with their seniors, they give them four brand new like Air Jordan type shoes, and they're not allowed to wear them until they graduate. And when they graduate, they give them four boxes of their size of different type of Jordan shoes so those kids can keep them or they can sell them. And I think they go anywhere from maybe 1000 to 1200 to 1500 bucks. So when they leave Oregon, you know, in theory, they have $4,800 to maybe $6,000 of shoes that they could go sell online or something. So that's kind of a unique thing they do uh, there at Oregon uh, with their seniors. But one thing I thought about is, you know, there's so much money. I, I, years ago, Alabama, I think their athletic budget, the football program raised, uh, made like $85 million or something like that. I'm sure it's even over $100 million now. And Oregon may be up there with it, as well as some of the other Power Five conference schools. But you know, maybe in programs like that, maybe it's by uh, a conference by conference basis, but let's use uh, Oregon, uh, the Pac-12 for an example, is maybe seniors, uh, guys who are gonna be seniors have had a chance to be wearing that uniform like Wes was talking about, whether it's Nike or Under Armour or Adidas. Um, and they've had that jersey on their chest and they're Penny Sewell out of Oregon, who's a, the number one lineman in the country coming back in 2021. And, and uh, maybe those guys get or make more money a month. Maybe their stipend, monthly stipend, is twelve hundred or fifteen hundred, and maybe the juniors is a thousand, and maybe the sophomores is eight hundred. Whatever on down the line. So that could be a way where it's controlled by the colleges and by that conference and how it's allocated out to the players uh, based on the revenue that's brought in by these guys wearing those brands. So, you know, that could be something that they look at and, and possibly do, but I think it's got to be par There's got to be parity. Uh, it's got to be fair. Uh, maybe the SEC and the PAC 12 and the ACC, for example, three of the power fives, they bring in more revenue. So there may be more revenue there to share, or maybe you kind of conglomerate it and put it all together and, and, and share it with all the conferences. But there's ways to do that, and I think those college players deserve to get a piece of that. They don't need to get rich, but they do need to be able to make car payments and put food on the table and maybe make a little bit more than they do make monthly with their monthly stipends. Right. Yeah, I think John, one, one thing. Uh, yeah, go ahead, One Jim. point I was making is that if you pay, let's say you pay the, the running back and he's a star, but the uh, fullback that might be blocking for him he doesn't carry the ball, but he's as important, and he only gets a quarter. What the? I mean, I I don't know how they do it. They better pay everybody the same, or you're going to have a lot of disgruntled players uh, taking sides. I would think. You know what I'm saying? Here? Uh, <laughs> Oops, I missed that block. Guys are making a lot of money, and this offensive lineman that's blocking some, who knows? You know, is making you know two dollars, and the running backs making a thousand. So. 
I don't know how you equalize that stuff. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, not at all. I, I One thing that I, I thought had a lot of merit that I heard somebody discuss was if you were to set up a fund for each of the players, regardless of how much they're getting, and I do agree with Chris's comment about the parity and what Jim said, you know, you, you there needs to be some equal distribution. But if you were to set up a fund so that all of that compensation or the majority of it is built up and they don't get it until they graduate or they don't get it until they leave the school if they get, you know, drafted, um, maybe that, uh, you know, allay some of the competitiveness, if you will, uh, that creates the inequities in the system. I, I really don't have uh, a good solution um, I think it's going to it's going to super complicate the recruiting process for college coaches. Um, and I and I absolutely believe we're going to see a if without some kind of control or regulation, I also th see where we would tend to see some abuse of the uptick that we're seeing now in the transfer portal. I think guys that all of a sudden, you know, somebody gets in their ear and says, hey, man, you know, if you transfer from uh, Ball State to uh, you know, Notre Dame, if you can make the grade, you can make a lot more money, that kind of thing, you know, and you start seeing kids jump, you know, ships. So not only do you have the inequities create, let's say, a lack or cut into team unity, but you also now start having a loss of that kind of team value that you see a lot of coaches build into their program. So it's going to be interesting. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have go, – go ahead, Wes. I, I, th I think that, that what Chris has said and, 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 and what I believe is if you come in as a freshman, here it is. It, it's marked. It doesn't matter if you're the starter, if you're offensive lineman or a star running. And as a, as a sophomore, here's a tier. It doesn't matter. As a junior, here's a tier. As a senior, a lot of these kids are going to leave at the end of their sophomore or junior year anyway. But if that tier is the same in the Power Five, it doesn't matter. They're all getting the same regardless of what school they go to in the Power Five. If you're not in a Power Five school, it's not because of, of, of the pay. It's because of the ability to play. So you just can't transfer because you want to transfer from a small to a Power Five school without having the talent. Very true. So if you, even at the smallest level, if you'll put out the same type of parity, you don't have any issues. You don't deserve that when you're in junior college because you didn't do the things necessary academically, uh, even though you had division one skill. You have to earn that right, just like this payment plan. Payment plan may call for one through four. And that, that's probably the easiest way. I don't have the answer, but I, I, I know that the parity has to sit. So I don't think the, the transfer issues are going to be because you just can't up and go from from uh, slippery rock to uh, Clemson just because you, you think the money is there because I don't think Dabo Swinney is going to take you if you don't have the talent to come to that school to begin with. So I think that that is yeah, all I, automatically by talent. No, I agree. And I picked a bad choice of schools to make an example of. But uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 I, I absolutely – I absolutely understand what you're saying, and I agree. I agree. So, uh, real quick, hey, William, have, have we gotten anything that we want to bring up uh, from anybody who may be listening or watching? Uh, has there been any kind of uh, stuff on Twitter? Uh, there's a lot of folks tuning in right now, but not not many comments coming in. Uh, I think you know, otherwise, uh, you know, people are just excited that we have such uh, great guests on tonight. Okay. Well, that's awesome. I tell you what, I, uh, I want to kind of, uh, respect everybody's time. The original goal was to keep this to about an hour and we're about six minutes out. So what I'm going to do is kind of close with, um, uh, with, with this thought in mind and allow each of our guests to kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, there there's with all the, all the things we've talked about and, and understanding the environment we're operating in, nobody really knows what the quote new normal is going to look like. Um, in, in life in general, and certainly not for the game of football. So going forward, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the things that have been talked about tonight on the individual as well as team levels from both a coaching and a player's perspective are very valuable. And what I'd like to do is ask each of the guests, uh, if they would, as kind of a, a, a parting shot, to kind of 
look at it from a perspective of the road you've traveled to where you are today from whenever you started in football all the way up through, you know, your NFL playing or coaching careers. Um, and, and if you were going to advise any young athletes, um, what kind of pearls of wisdom might you share with them just about life in general from an athlete's lens? Coach McNally, I'll ask you to go first. Well, I'm 76 years old. So my experience is I was one of those guys, and you've heard stories before, that when you walked out the front door in the morning, whether you were going to school or you were in the summertime, your mom and dad, they didn't know where you were. You know what I mean? You came home for lunch, maybe. You came home for dinner, and uh, dogs would run the street. You'd walk down the street. There might be seven or eight dogs running, and you'd say, oh, my God, this dog's going to bite me. And so what I'm saying is, I was brought up in what they call, I think, the greatest generation. I was back there where we didn't have the cell phone. We got telephone. I mean, it, it was a party line. Yeah. And uh, you, you walked to school. I mean, you didn't have to take a bus. And your school was like seven miles away and all this other stuff. So I was kind of spoiled. I was brought up old school as far as that goes. Now I think these kids... The problem they have with all the internet, with the phones, with the cell phones, with all the social media, uh, I would, I, w I, I wish I could tell them to turn back the clock, and let's pretend like we don't have any of those things to play with. But again, this is the 21st century, so you, 20, so whatever we are in, uh, you, you need those technologies to survive. So all I can tell you is what I went through which was just an unbelievable time and I, I wouldn't give it up for the world and i kind of feel bad that these kids nowadays will never ever ever be able to appreciate what i did that's the best I can <laughs> great <do>. words <laughs> chris miller how about you with the, the 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 sage from the northwest there having raised your kids like you did and being able to coach them through your lens as a as a quarterback and a coach and player, what do you, what what kind of advice would you give or do you give your young people now? Well, I think you know, uh, coaching with the Houston Roughnecks and June Jones and Dennis McKnight, who Wes knows, uh, you know, we we got a lot of quotes each day. We started every day with a quote, a quote of inspiration, or had some history uh, tied to it. And one of the ones that kind of resonates me is make sure you start your day with a cup of positivity. You know, start your day with a cup of positivity, especially where we're at now, uh, living with this uh, pandemic and, and being, uh, you know, subject to staying at home and, and all those things is we can kind of get in a rut. You know, I talked to my parents earlier today before this call for about 20 minutes and they said they miss going out to eat, you know, going and sitting in a restaurant and going out to eat and interacting face to face. They miss seeing their kids and they miss seeing their grandkids face to face. So. Uh, we've had a couple conversations with them uh, in the garage or through the front door, but I haven't gotten close to them. So, um, you know, so a lot of people can kind of get down in the dumps or in the tank right now. So I'd say, man, every day, every morning when you wake up, make sure you have a cup of positivity. Think about something that you're really grateful for. Uh, get up, make your bed every morning, take a shower, get in a nice regiment, get out, get some exercise. I'm trying to, uh, I, I climb my stairs, 16 stairs in our staircase here today for 42 minutes and put on my uh, AirPods and, and got a great sweat going. So I try to do that two or three times a week. And other, other days, two or three days, I'm trying to do 210 push-ups because that's three touchdowns, 21 points. So I do 210 push-ups and, and probably 45 to 50 curls with each arm. So, you know, find something to do to keep yourself active and busy. Uh, like Wes said, I think that face-to-face -face interaction is really important. And maybe this new normal, when kids get out of this, they won't rely on their cell phones as much. And maybe they'll relish that interaction with their friends of actually sitting around over lunch at school, having a conversation. So uh, I, I really like what Jim said, too, man. We'd, we'd leave in the morning and come back for dinner. Parents didn't care where we were. And, uh, and we were safe. So, uh, you know, I kind of feel sorry for the kids. Nowadays. That's what I would recommend. Start your day, day every morning. Day every morning with a cup of positivity. That's awesome. Great words. How about you, Wes? That's, that's really nice. Um, I, I think that that climax into my, my true belief 
for these young men today, they recognize early the, um, that they have a chance to make them because they've been told, they've been recruited, they read, they see social media makes it so much easier uh, for athletes to stand where, where they are in, uh, in society and how they rank and the opportunities that they have. When we grew up um, a little bit younger than Jim, a little bit older than Chris, but when, when we grew up, we grew up in the era where it was a village to raise a child. Uh, as long as the site was on, I was okay, I was safe. And if I was in some place where I didn't belong, mom, my dad didn't have to look for me. There were others in that community that made sure I got home. Whether I liked it or not, they had an influence in my life. So I was surrounded by influencers who had my best interests at heart and my family's best interests at heart by keeping me safe and demanding that I went somewhere. And they took me home to the front door. And my parents had no qualms about that. They were grateful. They were thankful. And I look back at that today, and I'm grateful and thankful. I have a 13-year-old grandson, and I talk about legacy. And I try and define what legacy is. And if you get the opportunity later on to participate in collegiate, uh, collegiate athletics and or professional sports, what is it that you want to leave behind? What is it that you want to be better member for? To do this when I was coaching on the professional level, even on the collegiate level here in the 2000s when we turned to social media world, is it the image portrayed or the character of the individual that you best want to be remembered for? A lot of a lot of guys don't stand the difference in the two. But I like to think that it's the character of the individual because life goes on. Athletics at some point comes to a halt. And we, we live in a time where we're not going to go back to normal. Unfortunately, we can open, and I know the times that we're in right now, this pandemic has created uh, from uh, from a uh, athletic perspective, the greatest opponent we will ever face. Coronavirus is the biggest opponent, either of us in all of our combined uh, time in sports. This is the biggest opponent that we will ever face. CDC has a plan for us. And just like in football, you have a plan that you have to commit to day after day, day after day to game time. And in order to win, you have to execute that plan. And when there's a breakdown in execution, like someone going out, not practicing social distancing or washing their hands or doing all the things necessary, that's part of the plan, breakdown, then there's a failure. So unfortunately, because of where we are, I like to think that that even with these athletes and exercising the practice that you should do every day, because there is a game plan that's been given to us all. You protect your teammates by making sure that the discipline stays intact and the execution is carried out. That's how you win. I remember back 9-11, and I'll close this. We changed the way we travel today because of 9-11. We were used to going to airports and traveling any kind of way we wanted to. 90 about a new perspective. We did not go back to normal. It became a new normal as to how we travel. And coronavirus is going to create the same thing. We will not be in a, we will have better respect for our spaces and giving people space and our awareness that this thing is real. Unfortunately, it's going to hack on some doors of friends uh, afar. I hope God willing it doesn't in order for people to understand that this is real. And that's the reason why I related to sports, because to me, there is a game plan. And I like, I, I hope and I pray to God, which we will get beyond this. But the faster we get beyond it is, is according to how great we follow the game plan. Well said, Coach. A great way to wrap up. I think that, uh, I think that there are uh, some there are some things being put out right now, and I want to emphasize as a parting shot, you know, a lot of people are experiencing anxiety and fear uh, because we're shut in. And and like Chris talked about, you know, your folks not being able to get out and do that 
uh, the, you know, the, the socializing with their friends in the restaurants and things. You also have to remember that the, the mental approach is a, is a fragile thing. And I, and I just want to encourage for anybody that, that is suffering, any athlete, uh, any parent that's struggling with issues with their kids that, that needs to speak up, get on social media, get on your computer, connect with someone in your neighborhood or your family and talk about the challenges you're having, because the best way through it and to be able to stick with the plan that Wes so eloquently talked about is, is to communicate and let people know what's going on and to get help when you need it. And uh, it's, I think it was Denzel said in his commencement speech, you know, I use the old adage of climbing a ladder. Nobody gets to the top without standing on somebody else's shoulder. So every rung that you go up, reach high with one hand and reach down with the other hand. Each one reach one and each one teach one. And if we work together as a team, we can get through all this. And as Wes talked about, follow the plan and hopefully we come out on top. And I think we will. So I want to thank Coach Jim McNally, Coach Chris Miller, and Coach Wes Chandler for all lending their uh, unique experiences. And uh, it's it, again, it was loads of fun for me to see all you guys uh, after a, a, a quite, quite a break with each of you. Uh, I guess, Simo, you and I have seen each other the most recently. Um, but uh, I really appreciate you gentlemen taking the time from your three uh, humble abodes where you're, where you're sheltering at home and uh, keeping yourselves and everybody else safe. And uh, we'll, we will, I want to remind everybody for next week, it's focus on defense. And these guys will appreciate our three guests next week are Coach Thurman Moore, Coach Keith Rucker, and Coach Kurt Barber, all three of whom had wonderful careers on the defensive side of the ball, both playing and coaching in the NFL and in college. And uh, I'm looking forward to discussing uh, some topics with those gentlemen. So more than anything else, folks, if you're watching or listening, remember, if you're out there doing something for the game of football, make sure you're doing it for the good of the game. Thanks very much and hope to see you next week. Thank you. Good seeing you.